This is The Chris Abraham Show. Hey there, this is Chris Abraham, Season 6, Episode 26, Vente Seis, Vente Seis, Vente, Vente Seis, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6, 7, 6, anyway, this is the Chris Abraham Show, my name is Chris Abraham, and I might need to pause for a second, bloop, bloop, bloop. Hey there, Season 6. Episode 26, I think. My name's Chris Abraham. <clears throat> um, just met a girl from my building named Natalia. She lives on the fifth floor, which is apparently a circle of hell. And she's training for a Florida marathon in January. And she goes to Orange Theory. And I just thought to myself, I know there was rent increase, and I know you say you don't make enough money. But you make enough money to go to Orange Theory and you make enough money to go to uh, destination uh, marathons. I mean, good for her. She's a rock star. She's my hero. And she's extremely friendly. So, Natalia. Uh, Try to remember that as Natalie. Natalia, Natalie. Anyway, my discussion today is about commodification. Nobody likes it when something becomes commodified. Once something becomes commodified, it becomes part of the market, right? Uh, Pork bellies and gold and copper and wheat and uh, etc. Things that are included in commodities is, of course, oil and, uh, of course, gas and, of course, uh, electricity is a commodity and all these other things. So... There's also commodities in things like milk and eggs and so on and so forth. These things are considered staples. And there is a an amazing citizen and political pushback against anything uh, increasing in price if it takes food off of the plates of poor Americans who vote. So when I was hijacked and I shouldn't have left NMS but I did when I was when I when I jumped ship and left Pete Snyder at the altar and moved to Edelman I got to see into the world of Walmart and General Electric I was on their digital teams and they both really wanted to find a way to revise staples and commodities as premium items right in the way that um, there are the GORUP GR1 uh, 21 liter in black, and that's X hundred dollars. And then there are uh, joint uh, special short special edition, you know, GR1s with Huckberry and Carryology, and they're generally um, impossible to get. They're extremely more expensive. And on the secondary market, they could reach $1,000 for a backpack um, if the market is so hungry for it. So if you can manufacture either scarcity or value add, you can very quickly start making people intentionally pay big money for cheap things. So Walmart was really interested in adding premiums by offering organics, right? So if you could find a way to deliver things that are labeled organic, you would be able to charge a premium on what is basically a commodity product. Um, If you can make organic broccoli, you can make more money from that product that has pretty much the same cycle and the same risk and the same input that you would make if it wasn't. If you 
could offer spring water instead of just purified water or add some branding zhu zhu onto the top of uh, of your bottled water or partner with a with a celebrity or with a sports star or with an actor you can take something which has uh, resulted in zero growth in the market because everybody is selling the same commoditized thing uh same thing with milk same thing with eggs uh you could add all kinds of words to eggs such as gluten free keto friendly you know you can say it's free range eggs you can say it's organic eggs you can say it's double secret uh wild chicken eggs you can uh find a way of breeding yellow or orange yolks into the eggs you can find a way to differentiate something that has been reduced to a commodity uh, so that you can break people away from expecting that a dozen eggs will cost X and that a gallon of milk will cost Y. Um, that is really the best thing ever to happen to the small business people, the producers, the farmers, the salesmen, the restaurateurs, the convenience store people, the grocery store people, everybody has completely taken advantage because they, they've... So you can only really get uh, anything at a round market rate, right? You can't really expect people uh, to, pay, to, pay, to pay double or triple just because... Uh, it's not 1975 anymore, right? But people will be like, people will riot if prices get too expensive. So what you could do is you could say that you're a health center like Whole Foods or that you're a, you're a specialty diner or that you are um, local vor or organic. You can, you can find a way of, of adding premium either service or location or... Uh, quality of food, supposedly, or the value add of a celebrity uh, chef or a celebrity owner or a celebrity spokesperson. And then that will not only draw more eyeballs because it's marketing and publicity and PR, but it'll also allow you, if you play the scarcity and value add game just right, uh, people will break through the resistance and they will actually feel like if they don't buy free range organic brown eggs uh, from Whole Foods, they're in some way abusing their children and poisoning their husband. So this is something I saw. I mean, it was awesome back in the day. The only reason that I was given a, an invite by Edelman for this digital team was because I wrote an article that and I need to find it. It basically said that the only reasons, the only reason that Americans don't feel as poor as they are, is because of Walmart, McDonald's dollar menu, and Chinese manufacturing. And my argument was, is that we've been able to take advantage of the cost of Chinese imports, and so in many ways we live. Our daily life, or poor people do. We poor people live our daily life um, in in a in a pro province uh, of uh, of China rather than living in the Upper West Side, where everything is more expensive. So, really, COVID and price gouging and in so so called inflation and so forth. Um, is what happens when the games of trying to value add um, hydro, uh, um, pH balance, um, um, adding alkaline, adding this is from, you know, this is Samoan water, or this is Tongan water, or this is Hawaiian water through the through the lava rocks or when I was at, at Edelman, Walmart was obsessed with trying to uh, turn commodities in their grocery stores to premium brands based on a promise of healthier, of healthier, right? Uh, I, I went to the doctor and every doctor I've said when I told them I'm doing carnivore, 
has never scolded me for just going to McDonald's and buying four McDoubles and throwing a well, giving giving all the bread to the birds and just eating the patty, the cheese, and the pickle. And they're like, that's protein and that's fat and that's sodium. That's what you need in a carnivore diet. You know, the pickles are are, are not important. The cheese isn't bad for you either. And uh, so, like, nobody's complained about it. They would prefer that I stick with my that I stick with my carnivore diet rather than dick around as to whether or not I need to make sure that all my ingredients are of the highest quality. I could not continue on the carnivore diet if I needed to always have grass-fed, you know, prime meat. If I needed to only get grass-fed ground, if I only needed to get uh, organic grass-fed steak, if I only needed to get all these unique and and rare forms of protein and that everything else was de facto uh, more harm than good. It is not more harm than good and uh, you don't need to always go premium unless you uh, you don't need to go premium unless you want to unless you have like Issues with histamines, um, unless you're unless um, uh, you're disgusted uh, by the taste of uh, generic uh, meat. I mean, I buy eighty percent, eighty-five percent. No, 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 the opposite. I try to get twenty percent fat, eighty percent uh, lean uh, meat from the grocer. That is what my macros need. My macros don't really care about whether or not something's grass-fed maybe over the long term but keeping my my only goal is keeping my uh, labs in true and I just received my labs and I'm not even pre-diabetic and I gotta tell you my carnivore diet has been really dirty but if the worst thing I have in terms of carbs is I will have pre-packaged fried chicken or fried uh Uh, chicken wings from Giant or whatever. And it's not ideal, right? I don't remove the breading like a crazy person. I just chomp, chomp, chomp on it. I put some sriracha on there. Thank God to the sriracha gods that sriracha's back in stock. And I go to town and I, but I don't have a side of mashed potatoes. I do not have a yummy, yummy, yummy. Oh God, I love potatoes. I don't have um, a biscuit with my with my chicken and I don't have a dessert and I don't have a fizzy drink and I don't have a root beer float and then I don't go out for ice cream and then I don't start it off with uh, I don't have pie I don't have a supersized coca-cola or mountain dew Uh, the most carbs I have in the day are probably maybe the dry wheat toast that I have with my a vegetable omelet with cheddar that I get from my Ditos, or I just ordered now an espresso. It's nice out, so I don't want to go inside yet. I ordered a super biggest black coffee espresso, and I ordered their breakfast wrap. And so there is potato in the wrap, and there is a flour tortilla, a flour tortilla, and there is sriracha. I get two sriracha, but that's relatively low. I mean, rap life is WRAP life is a lot lower carb uh, than is uh, big bun life or or submarine sandwich life or uh, if I had four McDoubles with all of the associated buns, which I did uh, out of shame last week. Uh, that's why I need to eat those burgers out so I can leave the buns behind. If they find their way back home with me and I don't throw them down the garbage chute, then they're done for. Um, what I try to do, and it never works out, is if I come home with buns, I put them on my uh, window, uh, uh, outside my window, and uh, the birds and the local crows go crazy for them. Um, I'm going to pause and get my coffee and I'll continue this. And the next thing will be about global warming and about EVs and about electric and about uh, about solar 
and about all that stuff and I'll talk to you. All right. So the first thing was just about normal experience, right? Like uh, on to renewables. So part of, uh, in case you don't know, this is the Chris Abraham show, season six, episode 26. Bente seis, vingt, vingt, vingt seis. Un, deux, trois, quatre, quinze, seis, seis. I got my seis and my seis all confused. I don't know if the French one sounds different. Yikes. Seis, 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 vingt et seis, vingt et seis, vingt seis, vingt seis, maybe, vingt seis. I do not know. I do not speak any languages, including English. So, another one of my clients at Edelman was General Electric. And apparently someone at GE said that uh, green is green, which is to say during one of their conferences that you if, you, if you jump on the green bandwagon, you can become dirty rich. Why? Because everything about uh, electricity uh, requires the purchase and production and sourcing and resourcing and pricing and buying and budgeting of completely new shit. You know, and if you're going to have to convert your factory to electric, you might have motors that are 50, 60, 70 years old. The technology hasn't really evolved much. To do all the retrofitting, to buy all the new stuff, requires more metal, new metal, different metal, rare earth um, metals, rare earth uh, materials, and um, requires new plastics, new rubbers. It uses... Um, petroleum to make the plastics and rubber rubbers to make giant giant megalithic um, wind farms you need to uh, basically buy all the ore everywhere whether it's aluminium or or plastic or whatever you really just need to um, buy an entire universe of new kit which means that you can it's almost better than starting a war uh, implementing a new technology because you need to fill an entire world with new shit that you mine out of the ground and get uh, poor people to make for you. And then when you're done, because it's new shit, uh, you can charge a premium for it. As long as it's new shit, Nobody knows what the price is. You can tell what the price is. You need to make it a little bit rational, you know, so that someone's like, well, I'm just going to use diesel. But maybe you don't need to do that. Maybe all you need to do is get the government to go in on it with you, and you can... You can make them trendy if people are really trend, but that'll only work with rich people. You can make them into cars and people or, or, or things that you can expense over 70 months, right? So your payments are really low. So you can, you can charge full price, but not only that, but you get all the interest on top of it which means you probably end up making, you know, more than twice of what you sold it for. Um, you can get uh, tax uh, benefits. You can get rebates. You can uh, get HOV um, allowances. You can get um, tax uh, incentives. You can get government subsidies. Both at the producer side, where the government underwrites all kinds of costs to make sure it happens. So you can either sell your vehicles or your products at a discount, but lose no money because the government's making up the difference. That happens a lot with farmers. Or you can just sell it at full price. 
or even more, right? Limited editions and stuff like I was saying. You can top all these things on top of each other. And then um, the government will make it cheaper, you know, either through, like I said, rebates or, or um, tax incentives or whatnot. So you can maintain your premium, your extreme premium. You can actually, if you completely revise the entire world to um, get off of coal and gas, which makes energy extremely cheap, you can make everything so premium in the entire world that uh, you don't have to worry about the shareholders about your country and your companies not growing, uh, growing, 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 right? So we were wondering whether the economy would become flat. And then we've been leaning into wars a lot lately to, to kind of keep the, the country going through the um, heart paddles of, uh, of war bucks. That's not a very good long-term solution. I mean, it is a good long-term solution because you get to both um, you get to both thin the herd. Lots of people died during war, and you also get to make lots of money. So there's no downside for that. The only downside is if um, is if your war goes it becomes more of a um, I call it October eighth. You know, people did not like how Israel responded to something that was very much like their own 9-11. So if you have that kind of domestic blowback, that's the only thing that can go wrong. Or if you end up losing. But, um... If Ukraine, if Ukraine loses, America will still win. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, like, you're taken over by someone else. And it depends. Are the rich people compensated for that? So. So converting trucks to green and updating, I mean, it's going to be the most expensive thing that the world has ever done. Because, to be honest, when, uh, when the first vehicle revolution happened, only the really rich people ever had vehicles or horses or anything. And uh, I would dare say steam trains were an amazing project, but there was a lot of real incentive to create steam trains because there weren't super highways. There really what there weren't eighteen wheelers. Um, the only way to get things from here to there were stagecoaches, and that wasn't working. Um, trains was the only way. Trains were the only way to start moving people. There were no planes, remember? Start moving people across this vast continent, and so as a result, it was inevitable. And while the country did uh, pay for a lot of it, it was also a really in, there was a huge incentive uh, that the richest families and the richest countries and so forth. It was sort of a sui generis thing. And then there was no market aside from um, trolleys and, uh, and rail cars and trains. There were carriages, there were horses and so forth. Um, and then there were these like quirky little uh, steam engine, rich people vehicles, bespoke carriages. Um, horseless carriages they were called that were like as weird as when the first EV dudes were running around in those silly electric cars but remember that there was nothing before it so every new car replaced nothing every model T every model A every early car every every car in the world up until last Thursday was generally uh, well, you know, until the 40s and 50s was a someone's first car. Now, the goal is to replace all these cars with perfectly good internal combustion engines and go to a very non-durable, uh, non, uh, non-aging well, 
expensive AF, distance limited, heavy, tough on roads, tough on tires, tough on suspension solution that does not answer a question that has an exclamation point on it, right? Like there's nobody, especially since um, even with the price of gas being jacked up, is not remotely as expensive as the gas in many other places in the world, except for shithole countries that make gas, right? America used to be a shithole country that made made gas, so that's why our gas was always 99 cents. Um, maybe Russia's going to be the only country, only remaining country with cheap gas, petrol cars, um, you know, five series BMWs, uh, five, no, five, five, 500 class, 500 series Mercedes, and five and five series, seven series BMWs, right? And you know, um, I don't think I don't think Russia is a million weir- years away from uh, developing a a network that will support EVs gladly, right? Like so, I do not see a short term future. Like if you still want to become a motorhead. Uh, you need to either live in the Middle East or you need to live in Russia or Hungary or maybe Poland or whatever. Whichever place doesn't uh, buy um, uh, the EV revolution hook, line, and sinker that realizes that... realize that there's no real solution for it. So, you know, maybe if you want to have cool um, enduro bikes and you want a street race and so forth, maybe Russia's your future paradise or UAE or Dubai or whatever. Um, But before now, they're going to take perfectly useful things like coal and gas and oil and gasoline and and, and, uh, all the other fun stuff. And uh, they're going to replace it with something that's less easy to work with, less uh, harder to source, uh, more challenging to resource and, and mine and mill, uh, and a thing that will require an entire infrastructure to be updated to, uh, you know, to, to basically where, um, what is it called, uh, the matrix is or whatever. Like, we, we don't even have a... a, 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 a a, a national electric grid that can deal with uh, an EMP or a, uh, a a really good solar flare. So, like, I don't know what's going to happen. So maybe that'll get fixed. That'll be good. Anyway, uh, this was just a ramble, and I'll talk to you soon. Love you guys. Bye bye. All right, this is Chris Abraham, season six, episode twenty six. Um, I forgot to say a bunch of other things. Like, I am not saying that climate change, global warming, climate collapse, uh, demographic collapse, population collapse, human uh, extinction, all that stuff. I don't know about that stuff. I mean, I'm not an expert. And one can say that the only way to incentivize in a capitalist society is to incentivize with money, right? So the only way that you're going to get this uh, pachyderm moving is by putting some really nice, uh, yummy, yummy treats in front of it. So one might say that this, uh, oh man, I'm really like, I wish I could imagine. Cause I like to think about how many, how many old things that work do not need to be replaced. Gas stoves work, gas heaters work, gas, um, uh, water heaters work, gas furnaces work, Gas engines work, gas factories work, um, gas ranges work, gas hobs work, um, gas motorcycles work, um, bicycles work with pedals. I feel like the most valuable part of global warming, global collapse, fear of like the unknown and the sudden desire to make everybody in the world replace a car, replace an oven, replace a 
uh, a motorcycle, replace all their city buses, replace all of the city trucks, replace all of the 18-wheeler tractor trailers, um, uh, replace all the diesel engines, uh, replace all the um, everything, all the infrastructure, all the superstructure, all the um, everything that makes up our infrastructure will need to be new factory produced, factory bought and sold using new resources that strangely come from the ground and mostly are made up of uh, petroleum byproducts because nobody talks in this crazy revolution of buying new stuff because of carbon warming, carbon uh, global warming and, and, and carbon in the atmosphere and and gases and forever plastics and and um, the end is nigh and uh, the um, melting of the glaciers, etc. Nobody talks about the fact that everything that is going to be made is going to be made um, by ripping open the earth and either making more plastic, more rubber, more metal, more steel, more aluminium, more aluminum, more zinc, more copper, Everything is going to be brand new. There's not going to be any incentive based on all this government money and the premium associated and the fact that the future needs to look high tech for anybody to be reclaiming all these things in order to resource them. Now, some of you will say, but Chris, Adidas and Nike are totally making stuff with their reclaimed rubber. Well, yes, uh, Nike's got a new line of awesome, awesome uh, heavy weightlifting gear that they're making using leftover shoe stuff. If I were to buy a home gym, I'd probably want to buy some of that stuff because it's cool. And the uh, rubber baby bubby bumper plates are like super cool, like flashy colors based on the outsoles and midsoles of uh, reclaimed Nike gear. But Aside from those half measures, and those are all good too, uh, they're basically going to have to throw away everything to replace everything with an exact copy that just happened to use electricity rather than coal, oil, and so forth and so on. I mean, people aren't even choosing nuclear. Know why? Because nuclear doesn't require as many people to buy as much shit, you know? It's uh, these giant industrial operations that require one person uh, spend a trillion dollars. Not every single person needs to buy a lot of crap, right? Why would anybody decide to build a nuclear uh, reactor if they can instead buy 100,000 brand new milled and minted aluminum uh, super um, wind farm uh, propellers? Uh, I guess they're called... They're not called windmills, they're called turbines, turbines, carbine, carbines. So, I mean, I am of the world that says that this is an entire... If, you, if you'll notice, who cares the most uh, about global warming? I'll give you a second. The World Economic Forum. The World Economic Forum cares most about global warming, and that's because they're economists and rich people, and they're trying to figure out how to keep on growing, 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 growing economies so that shareholders can make and make and make and make and make more money and that there can be constant growth and that there won't be stagflation or depression or recession or deflation, that we will continue the hockey stick on a endlessly upward pattern instead of suffering uh, the slings and arrows associated with uh, becoming an agra agrarian society. And uh, while I still think wars with massive human death is the better way to go, because there's no market better than having to make something that will immediately be destroyed. And the uh, arms industry is perfect. Make a tank, sell a tank, tank gets destroyed, make another tank, make a thousand tanks, thousand tanks get destroyed, make another thousand tanks. I mean, I guess it's sort of like being a 
a producer of canned beans because like people eat the beans and shit the beans and buy more beans so i guess being a daddy warbucks is sort of like being uh mr goya 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 did i tell you that when i was a little kid living in manhattan before i was traumatized forever and destroyed as a human by moving to hawaii the paradise of the world i used to run around the apartment saying goya 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 Goya, Goya, Goya. And my mom thought it had to do with Goya foods. Goya foods, because we had so many, um, we had so many Latin American uh, and Spanish friends. However, I went to a preschool in New York City that was a Jewish preschool. And I'm thinking that Goyam and Goya sound a lot alike. And I'm wondering if everybody called me Goyam. Uh... I wasn't a shiksa, I was a goy. So maybe I learned to say goya, goya, goya from having like my, I mean, I loved my, I need to contact him. He's an ad man in New York, really successful AF guy, loves, loves, loves the sticky icky, named um, 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 Lewis Goldberg. And uh, I love that school. I didn't have any friends when I moved to Hawaii at first. But then I had Artin, and I had um, Frankie Park. I had a lot of friends. They were cool. But if you yell out Goya, Goya, Goya in New York City, there's two, there's there's like a a, a, a quarter flip of what it's going to be, whether you are literally um, a fan, as I am now, of Goya brand black beans and Goya brand... Um, mixed vegetables and Goya band garbanzo beans and I love a Goya so much or it could have been the fact that everybody was calling me the Irish Catholic boy whose all relatives would always say they made me my aunties uh, made me wear the following shirt to my uh, uh, Jewish preschool uh, kiss me I'm Irish so maybe I ran around saying Goya 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 because little Jewish old ladies were saying, oh, look at the cute little blonde-haired goyim. So I like both of them. I'm not insulted by either of them. Anyway, so economists are making these decisions for us. And if I were an economist, I would want you to, uh, if I were a a BMW dealer, I wouldn't want you to do what I did with my E39, which is uh, buy it in 2001 and keep it until 20... uh, 22. I would want you to buy a new car every year. And fuck, who cares what what the old car? It's not your problem. So the fact that the entire world... And one might argue that um, everything is like going to seed and that we live in a world where people are holding on to things that are like not working anymore and that these factories need a um, uh, rejuvenation they need their VJJ uh, rejuvenated, and we all need to spend that money. And instead of replacing it with coal power plants, and instead of replacing it with with uh, diesel powered or um, diesel powered uh, locomotives or coal powered electrical plants, and instead of replacing them with with gas powered stoves and gas powered heating and so forth, why not do America 3.0 or 4.0. By the way, America's never been a first world country. America has always been a second world country. And we started as a third world country. You can find Rockefellers in third world countries. Just go to Ciudad de Mexico or um, any place in Africa, Middle East. Um, Just because America has rich people and lots of guns doesn't mean it's first world um anyway so i don't know i don't care much about the future of the human world the uh earth of organisms will always be fine there will always be survivors there will always be survivors of cataclysms there will always be survivors of plagues of death of of collapses in both hot and cold uh the most durable of us will survive and everybody will fucking die the hell off. All y'all feel like you need to keep everybody alive. Like, all y'all feel like you're house-sitting for someone. 
and they have like all these like freaking sickly ass dogs that require so much special attention and meds like like 20 AIDS cats and 30 diabetic dogs and and 40 blind zebras and a bunch of uh, type 1 diabetes hippopotami like and you feel like while you're house sitting for your friend you can't even let a goldfish die not on your watch and you know people die man like as many people died during COVID as regular, the only difference was that everybody categorized every death as COVID. So there, you waited long enough in my episode that I said something truly crazy. Um, the good news is that during COVID, nobody got colds or sickness or any other type of coronavirus or any flu or any other kind of bronchitis or, 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 or any type of pneumonia or anything like that. During the three years of COVID, all other ways of dying naturally was attributed to COVID. um, And the official narrative is, no, just those things didn't happen for three years. It's not, no conflation or anything. Anyway, do you have an EV? Do you have an ICE, ICE, internal combustion engine? Do you have any plans? I have such a collection. I will never own a home with uh, an electric uh, oven. And if I do, I'm going right out to Amazon and I'm buying a, one of those uh, chef's hobs that have an, has an external uh, gas can. And I will be doing all of my cooking on the desktop with that. Ha ha! Because I have cast iron pans and I have, um, I have carbon steel pans and I have amazing aluminium bottom uh, all clad chef's pans and your mama and i have grills and i do not like electric grills i do not like any of those freaking like cold to the touch convection conduction things like just say no and if i became rich i would do whatever it takes to buy one of those big ass wolf ovens and uh, uh, make them high enough so that i can so that a tall guy could use them and i will make sure that they are gassy as well even if I need to buy black market cow farts. Um, it'll be fun to see, I hope. I, now that I'm all healthy, I'm 53, 63, 73, 83, I might be able to see 30 years into the future. Who knows? Like all of us, I might be hit by a car today. On that note, I better get the episode up so that you can listen to this as I am prescient as to the way I die uh, before dying and you are all amazed at my omnipotence, omnipresence, and uh, my ability to predict the future. I love you guys. Talk to you soon. This is part two, same podcast, where I ramble, ramble, ramble. Raw hide. Goya, Goya, Goya. Boo, boo, boo. Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time.